Hi, I'm coming to you live from some random city block in Seattle. It's not the most illustrious place to do a video shoot, but the reason I'm here is because the sidewalk is over 300 feet long, which means I can unroll 300 feet of cable down it, which is exactly what I've done. That's how you can see me on this monitor, despite the fact that I'm all the way down here at the end of the block. Hi, hi over there. Now, why have I done this? Well, because I can. You're looking at an HD picture right now that's running over 400 feet total of the worst coax cable I've ever seen in my life. And that shouldn't be possible. If I asked you to try and push an HD signal that far, I can promise you wouldn't be able to do it. No consumer HD format could go that far, and honestly, none of the professional ones are really supposed to do it either. This is a really tough nut to crack without switching to fiber optics, which costs a bundle. The only converters I'm aware of that'll do this trick cost over $300, and I did this for under $100. Now, I think that's pretty cool. Not that I think it's actually useful. It probably won't serve any purpose for you. This is a very special purpose technology I'm using, but it's still really neat, especially because it's not digital. The signal you're looking at right now is clear, crisp, it's high resolution, and it's analog. And I promise you there's no consumer format that can do that. So I'm gonna take you back to the studio and explain how all this works. But first, I gotta walk all the way back there. Let's not bury the lead here. The reason that worked is because I was using technology intended specifically for use with security cameras. And security cameras are pretty much unique in the world of video gear because they have to run over longer cables than almost anything else. See, ideally, if you have a surveillance system like this one here, you want it to be centralized. You got a bunch of cameras spread out everywhere, but you wanna have a single digital video recorder and a single monitor. So you have a single secure location where everything gets captured and maybe you have a guard sitting there monitoring all the cameras simultaneously. Now, if you're securing a T-Mobile store, for instance, this isn't that big a deal because the longest cable run from the back room to any one camera is gonna be maybe 100 feet. That's trivial. There's several formats that'll go 100 feet with no problem. But suppose you've got several acres of land with a bunch of warehouses, your recorder is at one end and your cameras are all the way out at the other. You can end up with some really absurd cable runs, especially after you go through all the conduit, across roofs, up walls, etc. It doesn't even have to be that big an application. I found this fellow on YouTube who's trying to put a camera at the end of his driveway. Unfortunately, his driveway is a thousand feet long. That's about 300 meters, and there really aren't any video technologies that'll go that far. Over the last decade, the only video interconnects that most of us have used have been HDMI, DisplayPort, VGA, and maybe DVI. With the exception of VGA, most of those won't go any further than about 25 feet without help. You can get longer cables in HDMI or DisplayPort, but usually you can't get much further than 50 feet or so without a signal repeater or something like that. VGA cables could do better. They're regularly sold in lengths of up to at least 100 feet. And I've seen those work, but usually the image is pretty blurry and up at three or 400 feet, I don't think they would work at all. If we go back a little bit, you might recall using component cables in your entertainment system, and those will go up to further distances. I think this is about 100 feet. I've never seen this used before, but I have read online that 100 feet is about the practical limit for component, and I imagine it looks pretty cruddy at that distance. And hey, even if it would push any further, look at the size of this bundle. You're running three separate cables, and for a security camera install, that would be way too much wiring. Now, there are repeaters and converters that will amplify signals or change them into formats that can go further, stuff like HD Base T or HDMI over fiber. The trouble is those are pretty pricey. The ones I've seen are on the order of $300 or more. And remember, for a surveillance system, you're not usually installing one camera, you're usually putting in a lot. A warehouse system, like I was talking about, might have 16 or 32 cameras, maybe more. Adding $300 of expense and really expensive cabling to every single camera will just put your prices in the stratosphere. It's not practical. On top of that, you're adding all sorts of complexity because all those repeaters or converters can fail and they all have to be plugged into their own power outlets. Now, there are, of course, options in the pro market. This is triaxial CCU cable. It's used to connect cameras back to transmitter vans for live events, uh, sports, and that sort of thing. And the quality on this is fantastic. Uh, this is, after all, how you get close-up shots of football players who just won the Super Bowl, so it has to be good. It also has to be robust. You gotta have 
players tripping over it with no problems. And on top of that, it's gotta be highly flexible. To combine all those things together and also be able to handle multiple audio and video channels in both directions simultaneously, yeah, this stuff's not cheap. Uh, this cable, which I think is around 300 feet, was at least $1,000, and I have no idea how expensive the 1,000-foot ones are. Modern cameras have replaced this heavy copper cable with fiber optics, but it costs just as much because they're selling to a cost-no-object industry. It simply has to work, and it has to solve a bunch of problems that are really tough to solve and only exist inside the broadcast industry. Fortunately, they can afford to pay $5 a foot for this cable. Hardly anybody else can, though. To wire up a couple dozen surveillance cameras with this stuff, you'd have to spend over $100,000, and that's not practical. There's another format used in the broadcast industry called HDSDI, which has both the quality and cost aspect licked. It uses ordinary coax cable like this. This is essentially the same stuff that feeds your cable TV box at home, and on a good day, you can get it for about 15 cents a foot. Now, HDSDI is only rated up to 100 meters, or about 328 feet. People in the industry tell me you can push it much further, often as far as 1,000 feet, but you wouldn't want to spend tens of thousands of dollars building a surveillance system that's completely in violation of its specs. If there's a solar flare and all your cameras cut out, well, you just wasted all your money. And at this point, we've kind of run out of formats. Consumers don't have much reason to go any further than around the perimeter of a living room or maybe through the ceiling of a conference room, and professionals are willing to pay exorbitant prices for their formats. Everybody in between usually solves the problem with these expensive converters, and none of those have the low cost and long range needed for large surveillance networks. So where does that leave security systems? Well, there's one format I haven't mentioned yet, partially because it's several decades old and a lot of people wouldn't consider it common anymore. Plain old composite. The signal that we used to hook up our VCRs with over the old familiar yellow cables was actually remarkably robust. An ordinary standard definition surveillance camera can notionally push a video signal up to 1,500 feet, that's 450 meters, over a typical piece of RG59 coax cable. For that kind of run, you'd be looking at maybe $200 in cabling, less after bulk discounts. This stuff is small and lightweight, and you can buy varieties that can survive the elements or even be directly buried, which is great if you're going to leave it on top of a warehouse for eternity. Now, this isn't perfect. At those extreme distances, your image quality is going to suffer, and if you want to go even further, you're going to end up needing an amplifier anyway. But more importantly, this doesn't solve our HD problem. Composite signals like this camera uses were always standard definition, and for what it's worth, a lot of people can get by like that. If you position your cameras to see people's faces as they pass through critical locations, or if you don't need to identify people and just see what's going on in an area, then standard def is actually still perfectly okay, and it lets you get away with using your old composite cables, which are much simpler and cheaper. But this couldn't last forever, and it didn't. You might not realize this, I certainly didn't until recently, but security cameras have moved past standard definition. Most new ones are HD or even UHD, but the problems that had to be overcome to get there were substantial. The big issue is that HD video formats are largely digital, and to make this concise, I'm just gonna be very inaccurate and say that digital signals don't do as well over long distances as analog ones. One way to think about this, with an analog signal, if you impose a bunch of noise, static, and maybe mix in a signal from another station. When it all arrives to your TV, you see the combination of all these signals, and your brain has the ability to pick out just the one you want and ignore the rest. This is why back in the 80s and 90s, we were able to watch TV shows from a neighboring town through heavy static and still enjoy them. With digital signals, however, it's the computer's job to do that, and it's just not as good as you are at it. So when you get two different signals or just random noise flipping bits from zero to one and vice versa, the computer doesn't know what to make of it. This is why when your HDTV antenna gets tweaked just a little bit, you don't get static, it just completely destroys the image. Digital signals just don't work that well when you have a lossy connection, and that's why I think digital TV was a huge mistake, essentially the rich punishing the poor for not being able to afford cable or satellite. That's a topic for another time, but the point is, every digital format I'm familiar with falls apart instantly if it doesn't have perfect conditions, which means if you're going to have a long distance HD format, it's gonna have to be analog, and there aren't a lot of options. Going back to VGA and component, both of these can pass HD, maybe even UHD, I've never looked into it. Uh, the trouble is they use a ton of copper to do it. 
component very visibly uses three separate coaxial cables. So each one of these is basically worth one composite video cable from a conventional standard definition camera. So to use this, you'd have to triple the amount of cable you were installing. And while VGA certainly looks equivalent, it actually contains three separate tiny coax cables for the red, green, and blue signals, as well as a bunch of other wires for other signals that it needs. So both of these are pretty expensive per foot. And that's kind of um, it. Like there aren't really any other HD analog formats. As far as I know, nobody was doing HD surveillance systems up through the 2000s. Or if anybody was, they would have been using IP. And that's an important thing to bring up. We've had security cameras with Ethernet interfaces since the early 2000s, and they offer a lot of appealing features. You can run them off your existing network if you already have cabling everywhere you need them to be, or if you do need to put a camera far away from your infrastructure, you can run them up to 100 meters, 328 feet on one Ethernet cable with no problem. And if you need to run further, you can add a power over Ethernet repeater, which runs off of power sent over the same cable as your data. And if you want to go even further than that, you can chain more repeaters up to at least 1600 feet. And you don't have to have any extra power outlets. It's all running off of a single cable. This seems like a perfect solution. And for a lot of people, it probably is even now. But there are two big problems. One is you still have to buy those repeaters if you're going that far. And it doesn't let you reuse any existing cable. See, suppose you do have a huge installation with a whole bunch of standard definition cameras with all this coax installed. You can't run IP over this. So to use IP cameras, you'd have to have this all ripped out and replaced. You might have miles of it. It could cost tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars to pull it out of conduit and dig it up from the ground to have it replaced with ethernet. So that's pretty much a non-starter. You need something that'll run over this. And up through the 2010s, there just weren't any HD options. And then suddenly, there were. In the mid-2010s, several companies simultaneously released technologies that solved this problem more or less perfectly. And this resulted in a sea change in the industry and a Cambrian explosion of inexpensive little high-definition cameras that otherwise could not have existed. The technology behind them is remarkable both in how it works, how well it works, and how cheap it is. See, this is the camera I opened the video with. It's a typical eyeball type surveillance camera, and I got it from Amazon for about 50 bucks. It's made by Hikvision, who are a pretty big name in this market, and it actually shoots at 2K, as in Quad HD. They actually make UHD 4K models. I thought that's what I was getting. I just clicked on the wrong product listing. It's still pretty impressive, though, and I recorded that using this no-name security DVR, basically a little tiny computer in a box with a bunch of video encoders. Uh, it takes eight camera inputs, it came with a one terabyte hard drive, and it only cost me $180. I hooked them up using 400 feet of the worst coax I've seen in my entire life. This stuff is absolutely dire. It looks like speaker wire. I would be shocked if it met any kind of specification. It might not even be coax, actually, and all the same, it worked. This surveillance system records at fully modern resolutions, and it can span acres of property, but you can buy it on a shoestring budget. This whole thing rang in at under $300. I only got it with the one actual 2K camera, but if you were getting more, it would be about 75 bucks per camera, including the cable run. That's dirt cheap. And to avoid getting your hopes up, it's also probably not very useful to you. Unless you need a security system, I don't think this will change much in your life. There's not anything else you can do with this technology, and I'll explain what I mean by that later. But first, let's talk about what it is and how it actually works. This camera uses a single cable HD video format you've almost certainly never heard of called HDTVI. This camera actually uses it as well, and others use AHD and CVI. These are all unique to the surveillance camera industry, and they actually have other surveillance-only formats like EXSDI and 960H. All but one of these is analog, and all of them will work at those extreme distances, some as far as 1,400 feet or 420 meters. Nice. The reason you've never heard of any of these is because they're specific to the surveillance industry and there are no security camera enthusiasts that I'm aware of. I mean, there's just so little to be enthused by. They don't do anything. I mean, there's the pan tilt zoom ones where you can control with a little joystick, but otherwise they just sit there and surveil and there's only so much you can get out of that. There aren't really any levers to pull or buttons to press, so there's just not that much to do. I've never met anybody who cared about this stuff 
and I don't either. I just stumbled across it and got interested in the technology. And unfortunately, the story and details behind that technology are kind of hard to get a hold of. This was all developed in China, Korea, and Taiwan. There are very few English-speaking websites that talk about any of it, and those that are out there are mostly security installers who don't really understand any of it themselves, and they're just copying and pasting from other websites. On top of that, it seems like there might have been some industrial espionage behind this whole thing, so that muddies the waters further. So take this with a grain of salt, at least for as much as I can tell you. One of the juiciest primary sources on this is a blog post comment from one Daniel Ogilvy, who says that he developed the first analog HD format in 2010. His company, Sing Mai, had been contracted to develop an HD SDI camera for another company, but they saw the intrinsic length limitations and decided to make their own video format instead. They called theirs HD CVI, and they went about trying to sell it to other companies, including Hikvision, with limited success. Shortly thereafter, another company named Dahua, also a major player in the market, popped up with their own analog HD format, also called HD CVI. And I believe they were in business with Hikvision at the time, so maybe there was a little bit of collusion going on there. Ogilvy declines to accuse them of any industrial espionage, although the way things tend to go in the Chinese electronics market, I wouldn't be surprised, especially given the identical name. All the same, Sing Mai renamed their product to ACVI to avoid confusion. I should note that I've never heard of an ACVI camera, so I don't know if they went anywhere, and Ogilvy suggests that Dahua's patents would have made it difficult to monetize their product anyway. On the other hand, Sing Mai licensed ACVI to a company called TechPoint, who now champion and licensed HDTVI in turn. So maybe that's where ACVI ended up, I can't be sure. In the middle of all this, a third format called AHD popped up, seemingly out of nowhere. Nobody seems to know where it came from or who invented it. Currently, a Korean company called Nextchip seems to be pushing it really hard, they seem very proud of it, but they fall just short of claiming that they actually invented it. I suspect that there were other attempts to solve this problem, but all three of these seemed to materialize around the same time, and they all gained some traction in the market. This, of course, suggests that the market is a total mess, that you'd constantly be trying to figure out what cameras worked with what devices, and that everything would plug into the same ports, but nothing would function together. But that's not actually the case for a few reasons. First, it seems like TVI largely succeeded in the US. CVI and AHD mostly seem to be Chinese and Korean products, so if you're here, you don't really need to worry about it. They also seem interchangeable as far as the technology, in that I don't think there's any difference in quality or capabilities between the three formats. And finally, you can just plug everything into everything else. For instance, this is a full HD camera I got off Amazon for $17 brand new. It is incredibly plasticky and terrible in every way. I think the signal is kind of noisy, but it's passably HD. Now, this is a TVI signal that you're looking at right now, but the recorder I'm using supports all of them, and this camera will output all of them. There's actually a little joystick here on the cord, and I can go into a menu. You can actually adjust all sorts of stuff in here, exposure, white balance, etc. And if we go to video setting, we can switch this from TVI to AHD, CVI, or even composite. And we're back. This is the exact same camera, except it's now outputting plain old standard definition composite. Well, more or less. See, prior to all this analog HD nonsense, there was an interesting stopgap, a in-between format called 960H. And while it's not actually HD, it provides some critical information to this narrative. So we're going to talk about it now. If you've ever worked with standard definition video, then you know it always comes at the same resolution. For NTSC, that's 720 by 480. It's ubiquitous, and that's not a mistake. It was formalized back in 1982 by the ITU standard BT-REC 601, which defines how analog TV should be converted into a digital format. Pretty much everything adopted this, so that's always the resolution you see. But a few things have interpreted that standard a little differently, and you sometimes see 704 by 480 or 720 by 486, which has led to decades of people on forums asking what the true resolution of analog TV is. And the answer that's sometimes given is that analog TV has no intrinsic resolution, which is partially true. There is no concept of pixels in NTSC, but it does have a partly fixed resolution. An ordinary NTSC television signal contains exactly 525 horizontal lines, of which only about 480 are actually supposed to appear on your TV screen. The rest are basically above and below the screen, so most digital formats just throw those away. But anything that produces an NTSC signal still has to make all 525 lines. 
When a CRT television is drawing a picture, it sweeps the electron beam from left to right, and then it ratchets. It moves down one line width and does it again. It does this exactly 525 times, so you have to give it 525 lines of video. So the vertical resolution of NTSC is not up for debate. Horizontal resolution is much blurrier, however. Literally speaking, that is. Once a TV starts drawing a line of video, it doesn't ratchet its way across the screen. It just draws it all in one go as a continuous gradient of changing values. There are no distinct dots or pixels. If you're displaying a solid white line, for instance, you're essentially sending one long pixel because the intensity of the signal doesn't change as it sweeps all the way across the screen. There's no beginning and end to any particular spot on the screen. You just have one. As you send more and more complex images, however, the number of details in each line of video increases. You have more distinct dots. But if you zoom in and look closely, assuming you're using an analog camera as a source, you won't see any distinct divisions between each point in the image. It all just smoothly blends together. There is, of course, some limit to how much detail you can send. You're limited by the bandwidth of the TV signal, by the capabilities of the circuitry in the TV set, and the fineness of the phosphor or the RGB dots on the front of the tube. But there's definitely no hard stop in any of this at exactly 720 dots per line. That was a number chosen by the people who made Rec. 601. As far as I can tell, they chose that number because it was conveniently close to the practical capabilities of contemporary TV transmitters and receivers, of the TV signal itself, and the digital encoders they had at the time. And I could be wrong about that, but it's moot because that's the number we got, so we have to live with it. This means that if you put video with more than 720 distinct dots per line into virtually any digital encoder, you won't get anything out of it. It'll ignore those extra details because it just isn't looking when they come through. But if you control both ends of the connection, you can make a camera that outputs more details per line and a recorder that samples more often per line. And as long as you still send 525 lines, you can pack in more horizontal resolution without actually breaking compatibility. This is exactly what 960H does. The picture you're seeing on this TV is from a 960H camera. That's this one right here. Now this camera is sending 960 distinct dots on each line, which this TV doesn't support. The circuitry can't respond fast enough to display it, and the phosphor isn't dense enough to render it. So this TV is just blending those extra details together. But nonetheless, we have a clear, stable image. So in every other regard, this is obviously a compliant NTSC signal. You will notice one odd thing though. I'm squished. I'm not that thin. Well, if we flip over to the DVR that's recording this, you'll see I look normal now, as normal as ever anyway, and I'm also filling your entire widescreen monitor, because these cameras record widescreen NTSC. Despite standard definition always having been intended for a 4-3 aspect ratio, it's always been possible to shove wider video into it. That's what every widescreen DVD did. They took the 16-9 footage and they just crammed it into the 720x480 format. Then when your DVD player outputs it, it either squeezes it or stretches it to fit your actual display. The trouble is you lose detail doing this, You're using the same number of pixels to store more visual information, so you're losing horizontal definition. 960H squeezes NTSC to get just a drop more performance out of it just to make it widescreen. It doesn't really increase the definition of the image. If you take the signal from one and crop it down to 4x3, it looks the same as any other NTSC camera. But when you put the wings back on it, you have a wider field of view at exactly the same definition, the same pixels per inch, if you will, as a normal standard definition camera. It's a very clever stopgap, and I'm kind of surprised it never showed up in consumer hardware, but I digress. This is less a technology and more a technique, and I'm pretty sure it's been around since the early to mid-2000s. And again, it's not HD, but it's a crucial stepping stone on the way to true analog HD formats. Because these two are basically just NTSC with dipping mustards. This is what really gets me going about these analog HD technologies. When I first started reading about them, I was hearing that they were based on NTSC, and I thought they were just talking about color spaces or something. Well, look, I plugged the 1080 TVI camera into my oscilloscope here, and if you're familiar with analog video, you recognize that waveform. It looks like NTSC or PAL. If you take a look at the magnified waveform here, you can see the horizontal blanking pulse, the color burst, and then the active video area, just like any other standard definition signal. In fact, if I just move my hand back and forth here, you can see the shape of my fingers in the waveform there. 
That's a party trick I like doing with standard definition cameras, but you're not supposed to be able to do it with HD. This here is the signal from the 2K camera, and you can see my hand in the waveform again, so it works much like the other ones, and all of these work much like a camera from 30 years prior, just with all the numbers turned up. They appear to be based on NTSC that's just been pushed way past its limits. Specifically NTSC and not PAL, from what I understand, and I'm guessing that's because Taiwan and South Korea are NTSC countries. So these are doing much the same thing as 960H. They're pushing NTSC way past its normal limits, but unlike the 960H cameras, they're breaking backwards compatibility in the process. You can't plug these into a conventional television because they're not just sending way more detail per line, they're also sending way more lines. The timing is completely different. And I think they've altered the color encoding and stuff like that. There are probably some other minor changes, but. By and large, this is closer to classical composite video than any other HD format I've ever seen. There's no digital stuff, there's no wildly complex modulation, it's just what we had in 1956, but a lot more of it. And that's why it can go so far, even over really crappy cable. Let me demonstrate. This is what the 2K camera looks like on its own. This is going through about five or six feet of cable. And now, I'm gonna add my terrible 400 foot cable. And now the picture you're seeing is considerably worse, at least in my testing it was. There was ghosting, there was less contrast, there was noticeable color smearing, all stuff you'd expect from a long run of crappy composite cable, except here it's happening with a quad HD signal. And because it's analog, that degradation may make the image less pretty, but it doesn't make it any less usable. Your brain can look right through those distortions and see the underlying picture pretty clearly. And even if it doesn't look all that acceptable to your eyes, that might not be the format or the cable's fault. It might be the camera. I imagine everyone watching this has thought, wow, for Quad HD, that really doesn't look that great. And yeah, for $50, I wasn't gonna get a best-in-class Quad HD sensor. It's just shocking I got one at all. I don't think any of these compete with even a modern smartphone, to be clear. And it's not helping things any that the DVR I'm using is a no-name AliExpress special that probably has a really bad encoder in it and only goes up to 10 megabits max anyway. That's not helping matters. But even so, this looks better than any standard def camera for sure. And honestly, it looks better than a lot of low-end HD cameras I've seen. We can actually compare to some lower-end cameras right here. This is a 720p model that's noticeably softer than all the others. I don't know if you can see it, YouTube's compression might be doing a number on all this footage, but take my word for it, this thing is downright blurry compared to the 2K camera. This on the other hand is a 1080 AHD camera that seems to have a few years on it, appears to have been out in the elements for a bit, and I'm guessing is quite a few years old by now since it's got the old style bubble LEDs instead of the little surface mount ones that the TVI one here has. But all the same, the picture looks considerably better than the 720 model. It doesn't look as good as the cheap plasticky one, however, which I think is just because technology has marched on and gotten better. This actually doesn't look half bad. It does seem noisy in lower light, but this actually looks like passable HD to me. Of course, it doesn't look as good as the 2K camera. I think after seeing all of those, you can probably tell that there really is a gradient of quality here. I had assumed these would all just be 480p sensors that were being scaled up and that the whole thing was fraud. But no, they seem to actually be upgrading these things as time goes on, and I'm sure the 4K ones look considerably better than this. Probably none of these look as good as any camera you've ever owned, and that could be the fault of these neat analog HD formats. Maybe they just can't actually measure up to the challenge, but I think more likely it's the fault of the sensors. These are, after all, just security cameras, and I don't think anybody's going to shell out for top-of-the-line imaging hardware for them. Given how awful security cameras were for decades, any kind of high definition is a blessing, and anything extra is just frosting. And there are more expensive cameras out there, four and $500 4K models that I'm curious about, but I wasn't gonna spend that much extra just for this video. All the same, the footage I've seen on YouTube doesn't look as good as even a decent PC webcam. That's why I said earlier that I don't think any of this is gonna be any sort of life hack. When I found out that you could get a $50 2K camera, I thought, well, maybe you can get a cheap webcam that way. And indeed, they do make converters that go to HDMI from all the various formats. For $50, and $50 there, total of 100 bucks, you could maybe save at least half the cost of a good PC webcam if this worked. Unfortunately, it really doesn't. 
While this says 4K on it, that means it accepts 4K. It only outputs 1080. And even if you could get one that would do 2 or 4K, you'd have to get a capture card to go with it, which is still a fortune. So by the time you're done, you'd be spending way more. And on top of that, these only go up to about 15 FPS unless you really shell out for the high-end ones. So this definitely isn't worth it. Now, I also wondered if you could get a pair of these converters, one going from HDMI to analog HD and another one going back, like this guy here. And then you could have a cheap, long HD video run without spending $300 on a fiber converter. Unfortunately, that really doesn't work either. See, I tried this and uh, let me show you the results. I got one of my laptops and hooked it up to the HDMI to AHD converter. Then I went through just a few inches of high quality coax and into the converter to go back to HDMI and from there into a capture card. This is the raw HDMI output from the laptop before going through the converters. And this is that same picture converted to AHD and back. Yeah, it's not great. It's blurry, there's terrible color smearing, it clearly just doesn't work. I have not been able to find any converters that look like they're higher quality, and even if you could, it would all just be no-name AliExpress sludge. You would never be able to get one reliably. And that's not surprising, because that's just not what this stuff is for. The only thing this technology is meant to do is to hook up security cameras. So if you don't have any of those, there's probably nothing practical here for you. But I hope you at least enjoyed the novelty of the technology, which is really all I was here for. I can't get over the fact that there's been a single cable analog HD format hanging around for nearly a decade that everyone I know just missed. I mean, again, security cameras, they're nerd poison, they're boring and grown up and kind of for cops, but nobody I know picked up on it. I'm astonished that you can push an HD video signal over hundreds or thousands of feet of the worst coax I've ever seen and get any kind of picture on the other end, but even more so that these do it by going back in time beyond all the digital formats that became universal standards years ago and bringing forward in time our old familiar standby, complete with all of its quirks and issues, but also with all of its resilience, its capabilities that we unceremoniously left in the past. In the 90s, video cables just didn't have to be all that good. If all you had was a coat hanger, you could get your VCR hooked up to your TV well enough to watch a movie. It might be blurry, it might have lines to it, but you could still enjoy it. Even the crappiest composite cables were usually passable, and if you needed more cable links, you just stuck cables together till you had what you needed. This is that. It's a throwback to an earlier, less frustrating, less precise era when things just weren't nearly as picky as they are now. And the remarkable thing is you don't even have to throw out most of what we gained in order to experience it. Frankly, I'm really curious what it would look like if you put a native TVI interface into a PC or a game console and a matching receiver in a TV so you could get the best possible quality. I wonder how close it would come to a digital signal. I'm sure HDMI would look better, but wouldn't it be nice to have the option to fall back to something that's not nearly as picky as the formats we use nowadays? But I don't have a way to test it. So that pretty much wraps this up. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe so I know you like this sort of thing. Remember to turn on notifications if you want to find out when I upload new videos. Sometimes I go a while between uploads. If you really enjoyed this, consider supporting me on Patreon like these folks here are doing, since that enables me to get new stuff to show you. Of course, actual new stuff is kind of unusual subject matter for my channel, but I probably spent less on this ensemble than I do on a lot of the old crap I show off on here. So I'm incredibly grateful to everyone who's supporting me. I couldn't do this without you. And to everyone else, thanks for watching.